Okay, so we've come to our last lecture. I mean, you didn't quite as far as the syllabus this year, but, you know, things are what they are. So here we go. Our last time, Modern Nationalism, The Road to World War I. Okay, so where we last left off, this is more or less the political situation we're dealing with. Uh, the Franco-Prussian War has happened. Uh, that was 1870. Uh, between France, remember Napoleon III, goaded Bismarck into uh, declaring war. Uh, Bismarck was ready for him. Uh, the Prussians rolled over France, uh, grabbed up the southern part of the German principalities, smooshed them all into a united German empire, which is a little bit weirder looking than it looks currently. It doesn't look exactly like modern Germany because it includes areas that are now Poland, etc. Um, and so they established this great German empire and uh, the king of Prussia declares himself the Kaiser of a united Germany. Now, there's going to enter a phase of land grabbing that we call the scramble for Africa, uh, where the Germans are going to unite and ally with the Austrians, and they're going to try to devote a lot of their time to balancing the scale so that they can act as um, a nation that is as powerful or more powerful than the sort of traditional big players in Europe. So as powerful or more powerful than Austria, France, Britain and Spain. And Britain is really the one in their sights as um, the uh, main competitor. And so Britain has been very busily building an empire over the past several decades, well, more than the several decades, but they've been busily building a, a, a giant empire. Um, and Germany wants in on this. So here we go. Meanwhile, over in France, uh, the Franco-Prussian War was bad. It was a shock. France was invaded. Paris itself was conquered. They had to accept a very unfavorable treaty, and the people of France were bitter about it. They were angry. And in Paris itself, where people are suffering the most, they've just experienced a military conquest. There's food shortages. Everything is a disaster. The economy is in a shambles. Um, there's going to be an uprising of communists in 1871, and they're going to take over the city itself uh, for a short time. This is no as the Paris Commune. They seize control over the center of Paris. They put up barricades. You can see the barricades there and defend it. And so they, they repulsed uh, the French army initially uh, and try to establish a communist state in Paris. And they they do things like break into pawn shops and liberate workers' tools and give them back. And they, they try to create a little communist state. It doesn't last long. They're ultimately defeated. They end up getting crushed. But it shows just how close um, many places and many people are in Europe to making significant political breaks, really absorbing and adopting quite radical philosophical change. Very much the same. This is kind of the legacy of the era of revolution we've already talked about. Uh, this is really just kind of a second wave of revolutionary movements. This time, much like the French Revolution was, with an eye to truly trying to address social and political inequity and the conditions that are created and cultivated by the Industrial Revolution in Europe. Now, as I mentioned, the scramble for Africa. Uh, as part of our reading roundup, we talked a little bit about Cecil Rhodes. Um, and Cecil Rhodes, that reading I do uh, really recommend. If you're looking for a source to write one of your papers, um, it's very clear, it's very easy to understand, and it's like the most bald-faced, unapologetic, uh, racist imperialist dogma you're ever going to read and so it's really like wonderful to use for a paper as expressing a certain viewpoint because it's he's just one of those people you love to hate anyway Cecil Rhodes is a good example of a phenomenon that Britain is really getting on board with politically in the early 20th century they're not the only ones uh, but they're pushing a pro-imperialist grabbing more land to create an empire uh, agenda and they're justifying it those that support it not everyone does if you read Hobson you can see a good example of this in your readings as well of people who point out the problems uh, with imperialist doctrine um, but those who support it are really fusing the desire and benefits of having an empire as they see it with how they interpret Darwinism as well social Darwinism which we mentioned a little in the last lecture um, the idea that 
um, that humans are part of the survival of a fittest on a societal level, not just a biological level. And that dovetails into these 20th century racial ideologies, the idea that race is biological, not cultural, and that it um, means that some people are fundamentally different and fundamentally more fit than others. Those kinds of ideas are really going to drive people like Cecil Rhodes and people who adopt this imperialist dogma to push for greater and greater conquest and to justify um, some really quite a morally abhorrent behavior by saying that this is just how nature ought to play out. Uh, so it's a, a disturbing part of 20th century political ideology, but it's something you must be aware of. Um, also, technology is jumping forward. I've mentioned that a few times. Things like the telegraph make communication at a distance so much more accessible. Um, Cecil Rhodes here, what this picture is showing is him. Uh, he was the champion of ad an advocate for running a telegraph line across Africa so that uh, communication could more, be more effective. And so he's going to promote that there, but it's, it's happening all over Europe, all over uh, the Americas uh, and Africa and elsewhere as well. Uh, the telegraph is being invented. Electricity is starting to become more and more widespread. Um, there are engines, uh, internal combustion engines. There's all kinds of um, experiments with those. There's all kinds of really exciting and uh, rapid technological development that is taking place during this time. It's going to transform the world so that from the beginning of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, it looks like almost a totally different place. Okay, speaking of uh, roads in the scramble for Africa, Britain uh, is doubling down. They are absolutely investing very heavily in trying to consolidate and grab up as much territory as they can. They've got a little bit of uh, a head start over places like Germany, but Germany is going to compete. Uh, on this map of Africa, what will ultimately be German claims are that kind of, oh, that's difficult to explain, mustardy, yellowy color. Now let me circle a few here. Here, uh, here, over there too. These will ultimately be German claims, but all that bright uh, pink, those are British areas uh, that will be claimed. And then the, the blue is France. France, if you remember what life is like in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, uh, and going forward, they've recently lost the Franco-Prussian War. They want to maintain a colonial empire. They've had you know, uh, years and years and years of establishing colonial empires around the world. They have land in the Caribbean. They've given up most of the North American stuff that they held, uh, but they've got land in the Caribbean. They've got land in the Pacific. They've got claims in Africa. And they're going to press those because they see it as politically important, even though they are actually in quite a weakened military position. Germany is going to try to take advantage of that. There are, uh, the thing about the scramble for Africa is that European nations saw this as crucial to their diplomatic and political superiority. So they made claims much the same way if you were to roll back the clock to the 15th century, Spain and Portugal and everybody else was making claims in the Americas by just drawing lines on a map when they had no idea what was there. The same thing is happening with Africa. I mean, they know where the continent is and how big it is at this point, what the outside of it looks like. But people in Europe are sitting down, drawing lines on a map, and just claiming chunks of Africa with no idea what's there, who's there, how their own uh, kind of local identities uh, might play out. They're just arbitrarily claiming chunks and, um, well, sometimes it's not totally arbitrary, but they're claiming just chunks of Africa uh, as a political maneuver and not really giving any concern for how people in Africa might think about that. Um, and they'll use social Darwinist uh, rhetoric to describe why they should be able to do that. But at any rate, France is claiming a bunch of stuff they don't actually have any military presence in or very minimal military presence. And so Germany is going to start taunting them by trying to kind of encroach and push and see if they can grab up maybe some of these territories if the French aren't willing to defend them. And that really alarms Britain and Britain's going to push back. Britain has its own problems. What they had to deal with uh, at the very tail end of the 1800s and early 1900s was a conflict in South Africa. South Africa had always had a portion of it, well not always, uh, but for some 
significant time period. It had a portion of it that was part of a British sort of colonial outpost. It was a trade outpost. There was a good deal of slave trade that went through there. It was, it's quite a shocking history. Um, but Britain decides uh, at this point to consolidate the control over South Africa and press their claims against uh, the Dutch. The Dutch used to have a colony there. They're going to give way to Britain, but only after a significant conflict, after a series of wars known as the Boer War significantly. There were Dutch settlers in South Africa. They were farmers for the most part, but to Britain's surprise, they absolutely refused to go quietly and roll over to British claims on this territory and kind of integrate into a British uh, colony. Instead, they refuse and resist. And so Britain has to send troops to fight these uh, Dutch colony settlers over the land and it gets really bloody and really messy in part because as i mentioned technology is leaping forward at this time and it is in this south african conflict that britain is really going to see the widespread use of this thing on the left that in case you can't guess is known as a maxim gun and it is a machine gun it is a gun that is able to fire rounds very rapidly without having to reload all at once. It fires just a long uh, string of bullets. And uh, it is going to absolutely fundamentally transform warfare and how it is fought. Because unlike a single shot weapon where you would have to aim at something and then shoot and then reload and then shoot and whatever, um, even if you had a clip, you have to aim each time. Um, a machine gun can just take out a whole line of people if they're standing there. And so it make, makes it very impossible to stand in a line and shoot at each other like they did in the Revolutionary War, if you remember that. Um, instead, they're going to have to go with different tactics and techniques in wars after this. It's also going to make this conflict really kind of bloody and nasty and hard fought, the Boer War. And it's really unpopular in Britain. Uh, this is really kind of a test case. Uh, the British government is pushing this imperialist policy of grabbing up land as their chief goal. Uh, especially in Africa, but really anywhere in the world. It's not really that popular with the British public, uh, especially as more and more people are deployed, sent to South Africa to fight Dutch colonists. It's a hard sell in Britain to explain why British troops have to be sent halfway across the world to fight over a patch of land they've never traditionally held onto or controlled against people who were settled and already living there. It was not easy to explain from any kind of moral perspective obviously, because there isn't really a good moral defense for it on any level. Um, and you had, remember, this is the era of ideologies. You had communists, you have socialists, you have people who are pushing back hard against uh, the idea of colonialism and imperialism. You had a lot of people who were arguing at just purely on practical levels as well, that Britain is wasting money. They're wasting the lives of troops uh, in order to pursue this policy that isn't really benefiting the average British person. So there was a lot of conflict going back and forth and the Boer War was a shock to the system. It, it was harder and messier and more unpopular than the British government was really anticipating. Then uh, alliances start to play out. Germany is new, the German Empire, and they are looking for allies. And one of the allies they find is Austria. They see this as natural, not just because there are a lot of German speaking people in Austrian Empire, as there were, um, but Austria is not heavily pursuing a land grab at this point. Well, they are, but they're not heavily pursuing kind of colonial scramble for Africa land grabs. There wasn't any Austria on that map we just looked at um, of Africa. Austria is mostly focusing its ambitions on the shreds and remnants of the Ottoman Empire. They're looking to see if they can throw their weight around in that arena. That doesn't directly threaten or affect the German Empire much, and so it seems logical for the two of them to kind of join forces, to create kind of one big sort of allied superpower in the middle of Central Europe there, um, because they see their ambitions as not really in conflict with one another. They both would enjoy Russia to be a little weaker. They both would enjoy uh, to see Ottoman territories fall under the control of Austria. Austria doesn't care if Germany gets territory in, in Africa, uh, for instance. And so the two of them kind of work together. They form something called the Dual Alliance, uh, which 
uh, is supposed to guarantee their friendship with each other. If either gets attacked, the other swears that they will come to their defense, and an attack on one is an attack on both, that kind of thing. And then they'll have problem, you know, the friendly trade relations and all that kind of jazz. Ultimately, Italy is going to join as well. Uh, and you can see in the political cartoon how that was perceived worldwide. Italy's forces are minor. Uh, it was not considered a big power, and so they're kind of the little guy in this organization. Uh, but they ultimately will join up and, and form an alliance as well with the other two. Now, this being said, the alliance of Austria and Germany is going to make a number of countries quite nervous, specifically Russia, France, Britain, anybody that sees themselves, and obviously the Ottomans, uh, anybody that sees themselves as in conflict or having conflicting goals is not going to be happy with this. Otto von Bismarck is still the first minister of Germany. He's directing German policy to a great extent. And he is not stupid. He's a practical person. He's a pragmatist. He's the guy that says uh, nations are not built on ideas. They're built on blood and iron. And so he creates this alliance because he sees it to Germany's benefit, but he's going to hedge his bets. Here's what Bismarck spearheads. It's something called the Reinsurance Treaty. And it's signed in 1887. And what it really does is it says that uh, Germany, despite their public claims of having just this close, close, buddy, buddy, kiss, kiss relationship with Austria, that they will avoid as much as possible actual conflict with Russia. So I just want to recap. I would ordinarily draw something on the board here, but you'll have to imagine. Russia is feeling threatened by the alliance. Germany secretly goes sneaking around the back to reassure them. They sign a secret treaty, the reinsurance treaty, that basically says if Austria gets into it with Russia, specifically about the Balkan principalities, Germany won't back them up. They're like, okay, so we've got an alliance with Austria, but we don't mean you guys. Russia, you and I are cool. We're not actually going to fight. We don't really want there to be a war. The reinsurance treaty, the point of it, the whole point of it, this secret alliance between Germany and Russia, is to avoid war. No matter what Germany is publicly saying about nationalism, about uh, the natural alliance between German-speaking people and how much they love Austria, Bismarck's not an idiot and he doesn't want a war specifically with Russia. So he signs this secret treaty to keep that from happening to keep the balance. Well, here's what happens. Bismarck ends up out of a job because in 1888, Wilhelm dies and he's replaced by his son, Wilhelm II. And the two men did not get along with each other. Wilhelm II hated his father. They had a whole terrible relationship. He comes to power and he really buys into the rhetoric. He buys into the uh, Germany for Germans and uh, people who speak German are natural allies with us and all that kind of jazz that created the dual alliance. Wilhelm II really buys that and he doesn't have any respect for Bismarck and he doesn't have any respect for Bismarck's secret treaty with Russia to avoid war. And so he fires Bismarck and then when the reinsurance treaty comes up for renewal, he's like, nah, nah, we'll just do without it. We don't need it. We'll just let it lapse. So now, just to make it really as clear as I can, we have Austria and Germany have an alliance that unites the kind of central swath of Europe. Russia's cut loose and they don't really know what's going to happen and they're very nervous about this situation. Britain's really nervous about the situation because they have this buildup of this new superpower on the horizon. France is really freaking nervous because they've just been beat down uh, not too long before in the Franco-Prussian War. They would like to have some revenge for that. Also, they're really terrified that Germany is going to take over the whole world. So there's a lot of nervousness in Europe. And that is going to end up creating a situation where alliances are going to be formed both openly and secretly. So to do a quick recap, um, as part of the Triple Alliance, 
started out as a dual alliance. We have Germany, Austria, and Italy all united against each other. Russia used to have a secret thing going with Germany, but now they don't. And so they start asking for help elsewhere. They start reaching out their diplomatic uh, tentacles, as it were. And if they wanted a potential ally against the Germans, it's logical to jump on over to France. This is something you see over and over and over again in military uh, history that when you form alliances, the most common and logical ally is the neighbor on the opposite side of the person you share a border with. You can see it even in like neighborhood disputes. Uh, if you've got an annoying neighbor or a frightening neighbor, the person you turn to for help and support is the person on the opposite side of them because you don't have a direct conflict of interest and you both have a united concern about the middle neighbor. Anyway, Russia starts reaching out and creating a series of treaties with France that basically are designed around the idea that they will do what they can to limit the expansion and limit the uh, military danger posed by this German uh, empire and the alliance that Germany has with Austria, Hungary and Italy. So that's going on. Then uh, you have some other exciting stuff. Namely, all of these little republics down here, well, or down below Austria-Hungary, I realize you can't see that, um, down below Austria-Hungary, are going through independence movements of their own. Serbia and Bosnia, and there's Croatia there too, um, are going to be declaring independence of the Ottoman Empire, and Austria really wants in on this. Uh, and so there's going to be a series of treaties. What ultimately will be decided is that Bosnia is going to kind of be rolled into the Austrian Empire, at least under the domination of the Austrian Empire. That doesn't go 100% smoothly. But Serbia will be allowed to establish itself as an independent nation. Serbia feels really vulnerable about this. They're overshadowed by their much bigger, more powerful, ambitious neighbor to the north, Austria-Hungary. They'd like to maintain their independence. They need somebody who could possibly back them up. And just like I explained a second ago, the logical person that you talk to when you're afraid of your immediate neighbor is their neighbor. So Serbia is going to start talking to Russia and forming an alliance with them so that if Serbia is threatened by Austria, Russia will back them up. Okay, so now let's go on here. All of this is more or less known. What is not known publicly and widely is the fact that the French and the British have been talking. Now, the French and the British are traditional enemies. They don't fight to get along very well, and nobody really suspects that this is happening. But at this point, Austria and Germany and their alliance, and Italy too, is really making Britain extremely nervous. And they're afraid of the expansion of this power. They're afraid of that, the um, Germans, really, expanding into territory that the British themselves wanted to claim as imperial territory. And so they begin whispering to France, and this is all hush-hush, very secret. And what they end up with is something called the Entente Cordiale, uh, the sort of secret cordial arrangement. Basically, Entente Cordiale means cordial arrangement or understanding. And what it really means is that quietly, secretly, behind closed doors, France and Britain agree that if anybody, specifically Germany, comes sniffing around and threatening their colonial overseas territories, they will have each other's back. So France will defend Britain, Britain will defend France. And they see this as necessary because they're worried and threatened by the expansion of Germany's power. Germany doesn't realize they're doing it. So you can see that depicted on the, the political cartoon on the left. You've got the German with his big mustache. He's just la la la, minding his own business, unaware of what's going on. And meanwhile, you've got that man in the top hat and the, um, the lady in the tricolored flouncy skirt. I don't know why France is always depicted as a strumpet, but there she is. Uh, so you have France and, and Britain carrying on behind the back of, of Germany. That's what's going on there. And that really is a good 
visual metaphor for the Entente Cordiale. There's a secret alliance there. Okay, so when, in fact, 1905, this is tested, the Germans start pushing um, the French on Morocco. Morocco is claimed by the French. They don't actually have any presence there, though. And so the Germans are like, well, maybe we can grab this up for ourselves. Uh, Britain and Russia and Spain and Italy and the U.S. all kind of like jump in and are like, no, no, you can't do that. And so Germany backs down, but they doesn't, the penny doesn't drop for them exactly what this might mean geopolitically for their um, long-term European um, conflict and power. Okay, so uh, a thing you should know um, at this era is that very much like all the other time we've been talking about in class, the royal houses in Europe are closely related to each other. It's gotten to an almost ridiculous degree. Uh, the Tsar of Russia, the King of England, and the Kaiser of Germany are all first cousins at this point. So they're not even just kind of distantly related, they're all like related related and the families have been marrying each other for so long and they're so closely related that if you can see this is just very striking i can see it a bit with germany as well but it's very striking with um george and nicholas um how how close they look i mean they're like identical cousins um and what makes this picture on the left a little bit more confusing is that they're wearing each other's uniforms. This is a thing royals did, apparently, on diplomatic visits, is they would uh, make some effort to, um, I don't know, complement the other side by switching uniforms. I, I don't know. They just did this. But at any rate, uh, you've got uh, Nicholas there on the left and George on the right. They look almost the same. Um, and then this, you can almost say the same thing about Wilhelm and Nicholas as well. They're very similar looking and they uh, have a lot of similar goals. And yet they're going to end up very much on the opposite side of the coming conflict. Okay, as I mentioned, the technology that's leaping in and bounding forward. We just talked about the Crimean War. That was the last major military episode before the Franco-Prussian War, uh, which was land-based. Uh, in the Crimean War, if you remember how they fought, and this was not terribly long ago. Um, this is the 1850-1860 range. We're talking about wooden ships with sails. That was what a navy looked like. Now it's it's not even, well, it's barely uh, 50 years later. And what the navy starts to look like for Britain, for Germany, they're building a navy as fast as they can, though they have to play catch up. But for Britain, for the U.S., for uh, France, for everybody, they are building this totally new style and new class of ships. Metal ships, this is a dreadnought that you're looking at there, just a huge battleship. Metal ships, uh, coal uh, engines, and uh, all absolutely loaded with high power artillery guns. Uh, it's going to absolutely transform how naval battles are going to be fought and how dangerous they are and how destructive. A ship like this can do a lot of damage to a port. It's not even just a question of doing a lot of damage to other ships. And add into that that there's another technology that's really taken off. It was around as early as the 1860s, but it's really leaping forward again as well. The submarine, we'll get to it in just a second. Anyway, um, now, political situation again. Uh, the Ottoman Empire is sometimes referred to as the sick old man of Europe at this point. It is falling apart. They're just clinging to power. As I mentioned when we last were looking at that big map, uh, Bosnia and Serbia are breaking away from the Ottoman Empire, but it puts them in kind of Romania too. It puts them in kind of an odd position uh, because they're tiny countries. They are really active in promoting this nationalist, this modern nationalist idea of why they should be separate and independent because they have a common culture, common uh, religion, common languages, and so they feel that they should therefore have their own independent nation. Bosnia kind of comes under the thumb of Austria. Austria would love to put Serbia in the same position. Serbia resists and it manages to uh, defend itself as an independent nation. Austria would love to have closer relations with Serbia. They want to glom Serbia into their empire as well. They also want to settle some unrest down in Bosnia. Bosnia has a number of separatists in it that really want to sever relations with Austria, that would like to see Bosnia to be separate and independent as well. And they're going to be supported by uh, radicals from Serbia in pursuing this goal. 
So there's a lot of back and forth over the border between Bosnia and Serbia. Um, and in 1903, it kind of takes a, a dark diplomatic turn. The royal family in Serbia is going to be ousted and they're going to be executed. And a new government is going to uh, come to power. And this new government in the 1903 coup is really very hostile to Austria. That's how they came to power. And so Austria is unhappy with the way things are going. And so they're going to start exploring what their options might be. So what Austria decides to do is send a diplomatic mission to Bosnia. Bosnia is technically kind of one of their client states uh, at this stage, but uh, tensions are high and they're a little afraid that Bosnia is gonna go the way of Serbia, have a coup, declare their independence, cause all kinds of problems. And so what um, Austria decides to do is send a diplomat, Franz Ferdinand. Franz Ferdinand is an archduke, which means he's a member of the royal family. And he's an interesting character. He's um, very, very popular with common people in Austria because of his personal romantic history. I'm just going to give you a fast recap to give you a sense of why people love Franz Ferdinand. Franz Ferdinand uh, fell in love with somebody who I guess is historically sometimes described as a commoner. She was actually part of the nobility, but she wasn't uh, important enough for his family to consider her somebody who was worthy to marry him. And he insisted that he was going to marry her anyway, and that if he couldn't marry her, he wouldn't marry anyone, so there. Uh, so his family relents, and they're like, fine, you can marry your commoner wife, whatever. Uh, but they make him uh, agree to all kinds of ridiculous rules, like um, it has to be a morganatic marriage, which means that their children will be excluded from the line of succession and can never inherit Austria. And then also she's not allowed to uh, get the full benefits of his rank. So she's not an archduchess just because he's the archduke. Uh, he's, she's his wife, but she can never like walk next to him in a procession she's always got to be like a step behind she can never like sit next to him at like formal dinners that kind of thing so they had a lot of these silly rules but in the public perception here's this prince essentially that's what an archduke is here's this prince who insists on marrying the commoner he was very popular very romantic people love Franz Ferdinand so he was chosen to go to Bosnia to try to warm up uh, the government officials there to try to make it clear that Austria is their friend and that they could have pop, uh, positive relations and to try to make sure that things aren't going as bad in Bosnia as they had in Serbia. So he was sent there to give a speech and generally make a state visit and it was going to be great. He was really looking forward to it because he's technically out of Austria now, which means his wife can sit next to him and it was all very nice. So he and his wife, Sophie, go traveling through uh, Sarajevo in Bosnia and they're traveling in an open car, which uh, important government officials did at this time all the time. This was just kind of common practice. They're traveling in an open car and uh, they encounter some problems. Some Serbian, they were Serbian, but they crossed the border because they hate Austria. Um, some Serbian radical dissidents had crossed into Bosnia and were taking this opportunity to assassinate Franz Ferdinand and theoretically his wife too. So they'd crossed the border and they had this whole plan to like throw a bomb into the car with Franz Ferdinand and kill him and it's going to be great. Uh, so they're traveling along. There's an effort to throw the bomb in the car. Franz Ferdinand picks it up and hucks it back out again. Um, that's, I guess, a problem of throwing a bomb into an open car. It goes off. Some bystanders die. The car goes squealing away. Um, Franz Ferdinand's very upset, as you might imagine. Um, he insists on going to the hospital to visit the people who were injured. And he um, is like, what kind of show are you running here? And But nevertheless, he gives a speech. He does the things he was supposed to do. And then he gets back in the same freaking car to go back to the place where he's staying. And so they go driving back home and the, the uh, people who had been plotting to kill him are no doubt bummed out because they're like, oh, I intended to kill him, but we didn't kill him. That's kind of a drag. The open car goes traveling along a route and they make a, a turn and take a detour and they head through this alley. And just by sheer coincidence, one of the people who'd been plotting to kill Franz Ferdinand was walking in the alley. And he sees them coming through, through the past him. He pulls out a gun and fires into the car. 
He shoots uh, Franz Ferdinand and his wife. Sophie dies almost immediately. And of course, the car goes peeling away. They, they make an effort to catch the guy. They do catch him. Um, and as they're driving off, this is one of those possibly legendary, possibly didn't actually say at moments, but the bodyguard that was did no good at all, but was standing there with Franz Ferdinand in the car, turns around as they're, they're tearing off to safety. The Archduke isn't dead yet, but he's kind of cradling his wife. And he turns around and he says, uh, is the wound very bad? Is it bad? And um, Franz Ferdinand turns back to him and according to legend says, es ist nicht, it's nothing. They drive off and it's not nothing. And Franz Ferdinand dies. And now we have a diplomatic incident. Dun, dun, dun. So, Gavrilo Princip is the guy who fires the shot. He's caught. He's revealed to be an ethnic Serb and a member of the Serb nationalist movement who plotted this assassination. And Austria hits the freaking roof. The Archduke is dead. They didn't trust this whole, like, Serbian nationalist movement to begin with. They don't trust the government in Serbia. And so they go to Serbia with a list of demands. They grab up as many assassins as they can. They put them on trial. They're all executed. But then they go to Serbia with a list of demands. They want a list of names. Anybody who's ever been associated with this kind of radical group, they want the person names and arrested and interrogated. They want uh, everybody who's ever circulated like a newspaper advocating these ideas stopped and arrested they have a whole like list of things they want done I'm not gonna go through all of them but at the end of this laundry list of demands that they have for Serbia now Serbia is quaking in their boots because they're like Austria is huge and it's powerful and they're furious and they have a right to be furious because the Archduke is assassinated and so they're really mad and so they're like oh no and so they give in to all of these demands. They're like, fine, we'll arrest whoever you want to arrest. We'll allow you to interrogate whoever, whatever. We're, we'll let you do whatever it is you want to do until they get to one of the final stipulations. Austria demands the right to send their own investigators into Serbia to carry out an investigation and arrest whoever they want to arrest and do what they want to do inside Serbian uh, space, inside their country. And Serbia says, wait, no, I mean, we'll do whatever you want us to do. We understand why you're mad, but we're a sovereign nation and you can't, you, we can't just let other countries run criminal investigations inside our, our national space. And no, it's not, no, we won't do that. And Austria says, well, fine, if you're not going to give in to this demand, then we're going to declare war on Serbia. Um, so. Serbia is freaked out, as you can imagine, and they immediately call on their ally, the person who was, well, not the person, but the country that was going to back them up in the case things went bad with Austria. So, Serbia calls on Russia. Russia um, is going to call on France. Remember that treaty arrangement? France is going to call on Britain because of that whole Entente Cordiale thing. And presto changeo, it's World War I. That's literally how it unraveled. Now, it had been building for years. There had been naval escalation. You had both Germany and Britain building up bigger and bigger fleets. Um, you had military escalation all over the board where uh, armies are being built, weapons are being invested in. The, you had the scramble for Africa. Everybody's grabbing up land and in competition with each other. You had tensions over that colonial territory. You had... Um, all kinds of stuff. You had tensions over political developments. You had tensions over these new territories in the Balkan republics. You had tensions all over the place. So it wasn't like it was out of nowhere, but it unfolds kind of all in one. All of these treaties get called in. Austria calls on Germany. Germany is like, okay. Um, and then you had that whole cascade from Serbia to Russia to Russia to France to France to Britain. And everybody calls in their colonial troops as well. And all of a sudden, it's an enormous war in Europe. Okay, so here's how it breaks down. Um, it looks really shocking on the map. But you have to remember that uh, Germany and Austria possess a lot, a lot of territory, a lot of people, and a lot of military might in Europe itself. 
Um, so they're going to be allied. Italy is going to back them up initially and then change their mind halfway through the war. They do the same thing in World War II. Just make a note of it. Um, but um, at any rate, they're going to uh, create kind of what's known as the central powers. You have allies kind of on that string. You can see they're sort of pink um, here in this map on the left. And then on the other way, you can sort of see the global, on the right side, you can see the global um, allies, allied forces kind of laid out, which indicates colonial territory as well. The allies on the flip side include uh, Britain, France, Russia, um, ultimately Italy, and uh, the United States, as well as Brazil, interestingly enough. At any rate, um, they're going to back up and support um, I guess it's because the Portuguese are going to join in and be an ally too. But at any rate, uh, they're going to back up and support uh, the Allied side against Germany and Austria. And so war is going to be declared, and all of those huge armies are going to be mobilized, bigger than ever anybody had ever seen these. The armies of millions and millions, not just from Britain and France and uh, Russia and Austria, but all of their colonial territory as well every piece of this. This is what's known as total war, where you have civilians are going to get involved as well, uh, for specifically in France, where a lot of the battles are going to take place. Most of the fighting is going to take place uh, in France, uh, kind of in Belgium as well, in the area between uh, France and Germany. That's where most of the, the battlefields are going to be staged. There's going to be some abroad as well, but most of it is going to take place there. And everybody gets involved. It's such a huge scale conflict that even civilians are going to be pressed into service to do what they can for the war effort. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Germans are going to invest very heavily in U-boat or undersea boat, submarine technology, uh, and they're going to uh, pursue a policy of really unrestrained naval warfare. They're going to be firing at more or less everybody that's in their way. Um, in addition to that, some of the other weapons of World War I that characterize it and make it different from all other conflicts. You see the machine gun used in very heavy rotations. You do see some um, odd remnants of old-fashioned uh, military technology. For instance, uh, there are going to be some straight-up bayonet charges, people firing uh, rifle weapons and then just charging with them and, and uh, doing old-fashioned fighting along those lines. That's going to be a part of World War I, but also this machine gun and heavy artillery are going to make it necessary to fight in a different style. Along with those inventions, you also have the invention and popularization of something called barbed wire, which is a, a good way to put up a barrier to slow down people who are trying to uh, make rapid inroads across uh, space. It doesn't slow them forever into wire cutters and get through barbed wire, but it is something that will at least slow down the advancing armies. You can put up very quickly to create a temporary barrier. It has its uses. At any rate, between the machine guns and the barbed wire and the heavy artillery, uh, it's no longer possible to do a lot of that bayonet charging type of fighting. It's no longer possible to stand in a field and shoot at each other because everybody would simply get mowed down. And since you can't do that, people have to come up with new tactics. And that gets us to the, the characteristic tactics of World War I. Trench warfare. Because you can't stand in the field and get shot at, you have to take cover. And the most effective way to take cover from machine guns and heavy artillery is to dig a trench and then hide in it and then pop your head over the top every so often and shoot at your enemies. Uh, and so both sides, the Germans and the French, um, and they're Austrian and it's a British allies, are going to dig trenches and use them for cover. And so there will be these battles in the Western Front. Uh, Germany and Austria are in an awkward position because they're fighting both Russia and France and Britain and ultimately the United States. So they have to divide their forces on two fronts, the Western Front and the Eastern Front. The Eastern Front is with Russia, principally, and the Western Front is mostly in France. And so on the Western Front, they're digging these deep trenches, they're hiding in the trenches, they're shooting at each other, uh, they're not really getting anywhere. And so what ends up happening are just weeks and months of stalemate in many areas. And in order to break that, both sides begin innovating with their use of weaponry. Not only are they using heavy artillery, they're going to start using poison gas because poison gas can kill people even if they're hiding in a trench. And so they also have to innovate gas masks to prevent that from happening. The type of gas that they use varies a bit. Uh, there's going to be some chlorine, but a lot of it's going to be mustard gas. 
um, if you're interested. Um, and it's a horrible, horrible way to die. Uh, it was so horrific and people were so traumatized by it that in World War II, there's this a consensus that gas won't be used. I'm sure that it is, and it, of course it is in concentration camps, uh, but there's a consensus that gas won't be used in combat. And even Hitler sticks to that principally uh, because he experienced it in World War I and was so terrified and traumatized by it. He was convinced that he should never do it again. And he was so afraid of retaliation that he eschewed it. It was an awful, it's an awful way to die. You can see that young man who's a soldier he was caught in a gas attack and he had his gas mask on which is why he's still alive um, but you can see those horrible blisters all over his body that's uh, burns chemical burns as a result of uh, mustard gas most likely is what hit him and the way that poison gas kills you is that the same sort of process would happen inside his lungs and airways if he'd inherited, inhaled it and that will kill a person quite rapidly um, if they're hit heavily and if they're hit lightly it can still cause damage that will be permanent uh, even if they survive it and a lot of people come out of world war one with permanent lung damage that they're never going to recover from okay so also in terms of uh, military and technological innovation airplanes recent invention they're going to be implemented in world war one uh, they're mostly not going to be in heavy usage. There are airplanes. Uh, they are. This is where you get the Snoopy. World War One is where you get the dog fights, where the, you have individual planes getting into fights with each other in the air. Most of these planes are being used for scouting and reconnaissance. Um, they're not really set up for dropping bombs. They're not going to see that until World War Two. Uh, they do fight with each other. They become much more devastating and dangerous as a military weapon. Uh, when Roland Garros, he's uh, French, you can see him in the middle picture there, invents a machine gun that can be timed in such a way that it will fire through the propeller, so forward uh, in front of the plane. Uh, before this is invented, the only way to mount a gun to a plane is to have like a two-seater with a person in the back. I guess you could have the pilot do it, but it's hard to fly the plane and man the machine gun. Uh, until the Roland Garth invents this forward shooting one. Um, you'd have a two-seater and a gunner in the back, and the gunner has to be super careful if he's using a machine gun on a swivel that's mounted to his seat, because if he uh, is careless, he can hit the tail of the plane, or he can hit the wing, like he can hit himself, basically he can hit their own plane. And this does happen, and, and planes go down for that reason. Um, but Roland Garros invents a machine gun that is mounted in the front and timed to shoot through the propeller so a pilot can just shoot on his own at whatever he's looking at. So anyways, this is invented. It's going to be uh, captured relatively quickly by the Germans and imitated by the Germans. They're going to have it. And then you get into the World War One flying ace, uh, the Red Baron, who was a real person, Manfred von Richthofen. Uh, he's going to fly that triplane there, uh, get into dogfights with each other, and they fight back and forth. It's a very dramatic. All right. Tanks are another matter. They're a, a brutal piece of military technology. They're invented and implemented for the first time in World War I. Uh, there are tank battles. The Battle of Cambrai is probably the most famous of them. Uh, they're going to be used, as you can see from this um, war bond uh, advertisement, as part of uh, incentive. Oh, I don't know if incentive is the right word. Uh, basically, they're held up as an example of what can be accomplished if we just invest in the war effort. And um, war bonds as a part, this is a, another relatively new idea. This is a part of how World War I was able to be financed. It was so expensive. It's on such an enormous, unprecedented scale. So many people are involved, millions upon millions upon millions. The only way they can pay for it, um, any really government, is by collecting something called war bonds, where people will um, basically buy uh, a an IOU from the government that says that, you know, once the war is over, I'll pay you back with interest. But for right now, we need to raise money. And rather than imposing a tax that's mandatory, uh, we'll just give people the option to buy these bonds. And so if you have any extra money and want to support the war, you can do that. And it was quite popular and people did that. Okay, so uh, the World War One, it is expensive beyond any other war. It involves a proportion of the population beyond any other war up until this point. It is deadly on a level that had never been seen before. And we we saw the Thirty Years' War and the devastation that was created. World War One is worse. It is so so much worse. It's death and destruction. 
on an industrial level. This is the industrial revolution of warfare, if you want to think of it that way. And people who lived through it are absolutely devastated mentally and emotionally by it. Uh, the term they use in World War One is shell shock um, or battle fatigue. Um, and they come out of it so deeply traumatized uh, that it is going to govern public policy uh, in a very bad way, as it turns out. This is foreshadowing. We're not going to have an, a lecture on this, sadly enough. But the trauma of World War I, the devastation, the destruction, and the sheer loss of life are ultimately going to have a very chilling effect on the willingness of Britain and the United States and France to engage in another war afterwards. This is actually the war. It was referred to this way as the war to end all wars. And for the very first time, now we've been seeing treaties designed to avoid future war since the Treaty of Westphalia um, way on back in 1648. But uh, this is really the first time you see uh, governments really trying to do that to be seriously afraid of engaging in another war. Um, and that ends up being not great because what happens, because so many of these nations are afraid to engage in another war, uh, is that Hitler and the Nazis come to power and are allowed to militarize and begin expanding and actually start heading Europe back to another war. We'll get to a little bit of how that might happen in just a second. All right. Meanwhile, some other effects of World War One. Colonial armies are called in. Uh, forces and troops from everywhere. Britain has uh, huge colonies. They have colonies all over the world and they're going to call on them. So people from Canada are going to show up. People from Australia are going to show up. People from India are going to show up. Not just British uh, people who were stationed in India, but also uh, there will be troops. Uh, this particular is a Punjabi regiment, as you can see there and that are going to show up to Europe and fight in the trenches alongside um, other British soldiers. Um, this postcard is one of my favorites, and part of what I like about it is um, the, the uh, inscription there. In English, it says, Gentlemen of India, marching to chasten German hooligans. It says more or less the same thing in French as well. Uh, so it's just a, I don't know, I, it, it tickles my fancy. Anyway, so here we have the gentlemen of India showing up to chase in German hooligans. On the flip side, uh, ultimately now, they haven't joined the war yet. The United States is going to be part of World War I, but they are slow to join. It's very unpopular. It's devastating. It's huge. It's a horrible war. It's nobody in the United States or very few people really want to get involved with it, except for the American president. Woodrow Wilson understands the writings on the wall, and he's like, this. the United States needs to be involved in this because uh, the affairs of Europe directly affect us and we have to do something about it, et cetera, and so forth. Um, our strongest sort of diplomatic allies are Britain and France, and that we should probably back them up and we should do something. Uh, Congress has the power exclusively at this time to declare war, and they drag their feet and they refuse to do it, and they're going to create a lot of delays. We'll get into how that's overcome in just a second. Ultimately, however, the United States will join the war just at the very tail end. Um, and they're going to engage in some very heavy fighting for a, a few months. And some of the people who are going to be deployed in World War I include the Harlem Hellfighters. You can see this uh, military division that is one of the first... Uh, well, it's not the, and there were Civil War fighters as well, uh, but there is one of the first kind of official U.S. government um, African American units that is being that are being sent out um, specifically to fight in a war abroad, and so they're sent. They are. It's, it's a fascinating history. Again, we could spend a whole lecture on it, um, but. Um, they're sent out, they're given the absolute worst assignments, the hardest, the most dangerous, the nastiest things to do. Um, and they do it with such distinction uh, and such courage. And they're so, they're so accomplished, they get the nickname the Hellfighters. And they are so renowned as a result of their service, a very heroic service, that afterwards, in the aftermath of World War I, you have black soldiers who have served as military veterans. They're going to return to the United States that is divided by uh, strong racial prejudice. Jim Crow is everywhere. Uh, black people are effectively blocked uh, from being able to vote, even if they are legally able to vote. 
They are effectively blocked from equal participation in various, virtually every level of society. And participation in World War I is part of the events that break down some of that division. It's going to be something that uh, equal rights activists are going to point to and say, look here, uh, if black people are human enough, if they're equal enough to fight for our country, uh, then it's a shame and a ridiculous thing to try to make them into second class citizens at home. So, and that's going to the same sort of thing is going to happen with uh, British subjects as well. Um, regiments of, of these lovely Punjabi people here, as well as others from around the empire, will make the same argument. They're like, if you think of us as uh, worthy enough to be fighting in your army and fighting for your cause, then how can you turn around and treat us as less than uh, full British citizens? So there you have it. Okay, as I mentioned, World War One, total war. Um, here's just a quick visual for that. Uh, a lot of the fighting takes place in France, and as the the war begins to move on, there was a very famous battle, Battle of the Marne, where the front is moving, uh, and this was happening very rapidly. This is characteristic of World War One, uh, where you'll have armies stalemated for weeks or months at a time, not moving, just kind of parked in their trenches, taking pot shots at each other. And then all of a sudden the line will break and everybody has to move really fast all at once. And this was one of those occasions where the French really needed to move to cut off a German advance, a, a German motion. They needed to get to the new front as fast as they can. And they didn't have enough transport vehicles to do that as quickly as they needed to. And so they called on the taxi cab drivers in Paris and basically told them, everybody show up at the line and grab up soldiers and load them in the taxi cabs and drive them. And this is something that happened. So the Parisian taxi cabs show up to transport the uh, French infantry to the new line. Okay, now, how did the United States get involved in the war? You're probably asking. One of the factors that is going to change public opinion about whether to get involved had to do with the um, RMS Lusitania. It's a ship that was a passenger vessel. It went back and forth between England and the United States, um, and it was a luxury passenger vessel. There were lots of people on board. There were lots of American citizens that were on board the Lusitania. Uh, and because it was a civilian ship and a passenger ship, it was supposed to be exempt um, from military action. Now, what was going on in 1915 is that uh, enough people in the American government were supportive of the Allies in World War I that even though they couldn't get a declaration of war and the United States refused to get directly involved, the United States Congress, uh, equipment, supplies, uh, support goods, especially to Britain, where uh, because they're an island, uh, it became very, very hard for them to source food and military equipment and supplies. They, had, they were working very hard to get enough materials. Um, and the United States was secretly smuggling all of these goods into Britain. And logically enough, if you know that some ships are exempt from being fired upon, the place you would hide uh, supplies and weapons and, and all the stuff, extra food and whatever that you were sending over to England would be in ships like the Lusitania. The Germans weren't wrong about this, but it still was a passenger vessel. And the Germans decide we're sick of it. We don't care what the treaty says. We don't care what the sort of conventions of naval warfare say. We're shooting down this stupid ship. So uh, Untersee boats, uh, submarines, are going to fire torpedoes at the Lusitania. They're going to sink it and it goes down with hundreds of passengers, many of them American. As a result, the American public is shocked, scandalized, and horrified by these deaths. And it ultimately will become a very important kind of propaganda tool to encourage people to join the war effort. And ultimately, when they decide to join the war, uh, to enlist in the army and uh, become part of the expeditionary force that will be sent. Um, this, I make a point of doing this every semester, is a poster, a very uh, lovely Fred Spear poster, uh, by he's the artist, uh, that was made up to encourage uh, American men to enlist in the army for World War One, 
and it is meant to commemorate the Lusitania. It doesn't say that explicitly on there, but you see this lovely young woman with her baby sinking to the bottom of the sea with all the fishies, etc. And it's haunting and beautiful and very um, moving image. The reason I show this to all of my students is that one time it came up on Antiques Roadshow. Posters are what's considered ephemera. Uh, they're made um, and, you know, many prints are made, but they don't necessarily last. They're posted up places and they get damaged or torn down or ripped up or whatever. They kind of fall apart. So it's they're relatively uncommon to find intact. But and so people who and they're also popular to collect people who collect them, you know, therefore are really excited if you find one. This poster was not produced in large numbers and it was very iconic and therefore it was the most valuable, this came up in Antiques Roadshow years and years ago, uh, most valuable poster ever uh, found or displayed by Antiques Roadshow and it has been sold for, if you can find one in good condition, for it can go, go for as much as a million dollars. So if you have an attic or a grandma or anything that any place moved into a place maybe, um, and you haven't fully explored, go look in your house, and if you find one of these posters ever, and you have any reason to suspect it might be real, run, don't walk to your nearest reputable dealer and verify whether it might be a real thing, because if you can find this ever in your life, come across it, a real one, an original one, they are worth a ton of money. So, another little piece of information for you. All right, anyway, so here's how it goes. On the Western Front, the British and French are going to hold the Germans off. They're going to stalemate for quite some time. Um, and it's bloody and it's horrible and people are being traumatized and they're dying and there's poison gas and it's just a terrible experience. But they manage to hang on. On the Eastern Front, uh, Russia is struggling and they have a lot of the same problems they had even in the Crimean War. Um, there's no serfs anymore in Russia after the Edict of Emancipation, but the Russian uh, common person is quite poor. They're struggling to have enough weapons. They're struggling to have enough equipment. They are really having a hard time against uh, the armies of Austria and, um, and Germany. And so they make some gains. They have some successes, but it's not going well, and it's costing a fortune that they don't have. And things are getting rougher and rougher and rougher politically in Russia. Uh, people are more and more furious. They're involved in this war. Very few people in Russia really care or are involved too much in it. They, they are poor and desperate, and there is so much inequality in Russia, and they're really angry. And remember how I told you that the whole Emancipation Way thing that went down, it was going to come back and bite Russia in the butt? Well, here it comes. In 1917, there's a revolution. It's not the first one, but this is the one that's going to stick. It's going to overthrow the Tsar. Uh, so the Bolsheviks, they're communists. They're going to take over the uh, government, overthrow the Tsar, who's going to step down and try to form a new government. The Russian royal family, the Tsar is going to abdicate. The Russian royal family is going to be taken prisoner. Ultimately, they're going to be murdered, sadly, for them. Um, they're going to be murdered and kind of buried. Uh, and there's going to be rumors that maybe the littlest girl, there you can see her there on the chair, um, Anastasia might have escaped. And there's going to be numbers of people who claim to be Anastasia throughout the years. None of them are her, as far as we can tell. Uh, she does get killed. Um, but they're going to be executed along with their uh, kind of spiritual advisor, Rasputin, whom everybody found was creepy. The only real reason I put him up there, a lot of people have heard of Rasputin. He gets this kind of larger than life legend that attaches to him, at least in part because uh, he was creepy. In the royal family, um, the young son there um, had uh, hemophilia and the, uh, the Tsarina, the, uh, the Tsar's wife, um, was really desperate to try to find like medical intervention, but then kind of spiritual support as well. It was a whole like long saga. And a lot of people felt that Rasputin, who is this sort of monk figure, but odd and creepy, um, that he had the whole royal family kind of mesmerized to do his bidding. It was a long, bizarre story. But part of the long, bizarre story of Rasputin is that according to legend, when he's killed, when he's rounded up and killed as a royalist, um, he, when they find his body, uh, he was like stabbed, shot, beaten, and then ultimately tied up and thrown into a river. And when they did the autopsy, they're like, 
after all of that, like, multiple being shot and stabbed and all that kind of stuff, he drowned. <laughs> like, none of that killed him. It was just freaky. They're like, God, he was like a vampire or something. Anyway, there's all these weird legends of Rasputin. At any rate, uh, the Russian royal family uh, is uh, ultimately deposed. They are imprisoned and then executed. And a communist government is established. Uh, the original leaders, Trotsky, Lenin, and Kamenev there are going to get together to try to figure out how they want to organize that. There's going to be a revolution um, that, well, as I mentioned, there was an earlier revolution in 1905 that had been suppressed, but in 1917 it actually uh, works. Now this is in the middle of World War I, when Russia was under a great deal of pressure, and initially... Uh, as the Bolsheviks take over the Russian government, the assumption is that they are going to end the war and just sue for peace with Germany. And Germany was really hoping they'd do that. They had all of their whole like exit strategy based around this. But they demand that Russia pay them um, reparations and they demand that Russia give them a whole bunch of concessions. And the Bolshevik uh, government's like, no, we might be Bolsheviks, we're not pushovers, forget it. And they're going to hang in there and stick with the war for another year or more. And that is going to put Germany in a really awkward position because uh, the British are ramping up their uh, efforts. So while the Russians are hanging on uh, in 1917 and they're into 1918 and they're going to stick the war, at the same time, the British are doubling down. Now, ultimately, the Russians are going to sign a treaty, March 1918, uh, where they are going to quit World War I, largely because there's a civil war that's going to break out between the Red Army, the Bolsheviks, and the White Army, where the Royalists are going to try to put uh, the royal family back on the throne before they get executed. And so there's going to be this civil war that's happening in Russia, and they can no longer be that engaged in World War I. However, uh, what ultimately happens, I'm going to sort of skip over the details of the rest of it, what ultimately happens is that this gap uh, between when the Bolsheviks take over and when they leave the war is going to create an opening for the British. Uh, here you just see some political cartoons uh, that present opposing viewpoints. On the one side, you have Trotsky, who is depicted as the devil who's taken over Russia and is smashing everything, and he's actually a Jew. There's anti-Semitism, the really main streak in this. Um, and he's got this sort of river of skulls that he's overlooking. On the other side, you have Lenin, who's Trotsky's ally and friend, depicted as St. George, slaying the dragon of capitalism. Uh, so, yeah, we've got um, propaganda on both sides. Ultimately, I should probably say this because we're not going to have another lecture. Um, ultimately, of course, it is going to be the Bolsheviks who uh, triumph and a communist government is going to be set up and it's going to create the new USSR or um, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. So in that gap, what happens? The British are going to make some serious military advances. They're going to uh, deploy even more troops. They're going to put uh, the Germans on the run. And at the same time, the Americans decide to join the war. They declare war in April of 1917. But they don't actually show up. It takes a while to deploy. They don't actually show up until uh, 1918. And so that delay where the Russians don't quite lead the war, like quite leave, is going to end up costing the Germans seriously. By the time the Americans show up, it's really the final nail in the coffin. The British troops have taken heavy, heavy losses. They just can't continue in the way that they have. They are beat. Later, and this is again something we won't, unfortunately aren't going to have time to get into, um, prior to World War II, one of the, the pieces of propaganda that Hitler promotes is the idea that Germany didn't really lose World War I, but they were forced to accept a surrender because they were stabbed in the back by uh, secret forces, the fifth column working against them, mostly Jewish secret forces in the case of what Hitler tries to convince people of. 
Um, and that we weren't actually beaten, but we were stabbed in the back, and that's why we surrendered. This is a total lie, and you should know that. The Germans were beat. Their army was down to ragged dregs. And then the, the Americans join in in 1918, and it is clear that it is over. You have this infusion of fresh forces. It's obvious that it is not going to work out. And so very quickly, there's a 100 days offensive, and uh, the Germans start looking at a way out of this. They start thinking about suing for peace very seriously. Uh, the leader of the American Expeditionary Forces, this guy, General John, known as Blackjack uh, Pershing, he is going to uh, promote a very aggressive strategy for land forces in World War I. Um, and he also, and this is going to be one of those hindsight is 2020 moments, he is going to make the argument that Germany should not be let off easy that and he of course is making this argument as the leader of a very fresh expeditionary force that's showing up from uh, the United States and hasn't had years of uh, millions of people uh, fighting and dying but um, nevertheless he's going to push forward this idea that it would be wrong to accept Germany's surrender too quickly that instead uh, the Americans the British the French ought to really press this conflict uh, until they have invaded Germany and really forced the Germans to feel that they have been defeated. You shouldn't allow the Germans to surrender while still on the battlefield in France, in other words. So the Hundred Days Offensive goes like this. The British, the French, the Americans break the Germans. They push back, they break the lines, they cross over. The Germans are down to the ragged shreds of what they once were. They are beaten and beaten and beaten until November 11th, 1918, when they sue for peace and an armistice is going to be signed. This is a little picture of the armistice there. So November 11th, 1918, this will be the end of World War One. As I mentioned, the fighting part of World War One. as I mentioned, John Blackjack Pershing is going to be one of the sole voices of dissent, uh, the American leader of the expeditionary forces. He's going to push for a continuation of conflict, of not accepting the Germans' uh, surrender until they have really been forcibly beaten and invaded. Everyone else, the French, the British, they've taken millions, millions upon millions of casualties. They look over him at, at Pershing and are like, are you out of your mind? We are not continuing this. We're done. Done. We're not fighting anymore. And so they accept the armistice and that will be it. All right. So quick recap of how many people and why they called this the war to end all wars, why it's referred to as World War I. There will be a second world war, obviously. Uh, and um, why it's considered at a totally different scale than any other conflict we've already talked about. It's because it was at a totally different scale from any other conflict we've talked about. Um, the people involved, the numbers are enormous. I know that it may be difficult for you to see the numbers on this chart, so I've kind of put the some of the more uh, staggering ones over there uh, big so you can see them. Uh, but one of the things I'll draw your attention to that I didn't uh, list out separately is the number of personnel that are listed on this chart. In France, where most of the battles take place, personnel include not just the soldiers, people who are actively fighting, but everybody who was involved in the war effort. So medical staff and uh, supply support, transport, all that kind of stuff. And it's eight and a half million people can be considered actively involved in the war effort. And of those eight and a half million people, um, 1.4 million are going to die in World War I with another 4 million people wounded. And when it says wounded in action, they don't mean they had a cut or a bruise or some kind of temporary injury. That doesn't count. They're talking about people who are wounded permanently. So they have permanent lung damage as a result of the gas, or they've lost a limb, or they've lost something that is never going to heal. That's how you make that list. Um, and so you have casualty rates of 5 million people um, of, of just the French. And then, of the British troops, you have 800,000 uh, deaths. These are just the death tolls. Russia, who fought for so many years in, on the Eastern Front, 1.8 million troops lost, and that's just death. So you can double that figure at least if you're talking about injuries, permanent injuries, that is, uh, civilian casualties, which aren't counted as the same uh, thing. And so it is 
massive. And of the Americans, in case you're wondering, they only took took place in heavy fighting for almost that hundred days. It's basically it. And still 116,000 Americans die, which is a drop in the bucket compared to the French or the Russians, the British. But nevertheless, it's a huge, it's a staggering number for the American troops uh, to face. It was a massively deadly and devastating war. Even more so on the opposite side, the Central Powers. Um, 1.1 million Austrians, 2 million Germans, 770 thousand Ottomans are all going to die. This is the death rate. This chart's a little easier to read because there's fewer people on it. Um, and you can see that military deaths are only a portion of it. There's civilian deaths that are unacceptably high. Also, they have uh, famine and disease. The impact of this war is staggering. By the time everything is said and done, more than 10 million people are going to die as a result of direct military action. And then probably... No, the estimates vary, but you can almost double that number in terms of people who die prematurely as a result of this uh, conflict. It was devastating on a scale and at a level that no one had ever anticipated or experienced before, and people are going to come out of World War I desperate to make sure this doesn't happen again.